Let's read the word of God together. Passage is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 26. All right, so I'll begin. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not uh, show favoritism. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those he, who love him? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? All right, now William will give the message. Good morning, everyone. I'm still uh, uh, in awe of what a wonderful stage we have now. You know, I can't even remember what it was like before. It's like Noah's Ark. <laughs> so big. I mean, I always thought like our rafters reminded me of Noah's Ark, but now like the stage also. It's great. We're, bu we're building an uh, important uh, work of God. Let's see here. Okay. Okay, hit play. Okay, great, 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 great. All right. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Yeah. Um, Happy New Year. That's a big deal. Praise the Lord. Twenty twenty-two. Uh, may uh, it be uh, the best most fruitful year of any of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. The title of today's uh, uh, important message is, and I'm, I'm continuing my, uh, my effort to try to find one word t 
titles. It's uh, mercy. It comes from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 26, and the key verse is James 2, 13. Now, you may not have been expecting this as the key verse, but let's read this key verse together, okay? Let's go. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, let's pray real quick. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for this new life in Christ. Thank you for the powerful work. Thank you, for, uh, uh, thank you Father, for sending your one only son to open a way for uh, those lost in darkness that they might find a new life in Christ. Thank you for the teachings of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for uh, the beauty of its um, totally opposite from this world. And thank you so much for your servant James who um, really acted as a light in the darkness and even helped um, uh, many believers who didn't know what was going wrong with their spiritual lives to give wisdom and to give insight and to shine a light on the issues. Um, thank you so much for chapter 2. May you guide us and uh, bless us through today's passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, last week we began our, uh, our first message in the book of James. Now if you remember, uh, we met this guy named James who is a spiritual master builder. And throughout chapter 1, he laid down a lot of different topics that we're going to see repeated over and over throughout the rest of the four chapters. Now, one of the big uh, opening topics that he touched on is trials, the testing of faith. Now, he, he's told us in uh, this uh, first chapter about trials that we should consider it, consider trials what? Pure joy. I mean, boy, what a radical uh, challenge, even from the beginning. Because uh, the reason why he said to consider it pure joy, he gave us a reason is because uh, trials, the testing of our faith, produces this thing called steadfastness, the ability to really put into practice like an, like an unmovable uh, uh, lighthouse the, the faith of God, especially uh, faith in Jesus Christ and his teachings. So this steadfastness is very, very important because, as he said, steadfastness, uh, when it finishes its work, uh, makes us mature and complete and not lacking anything. So as Christians, instead of being a half-built house that was never finished or one that's uh, kind of fallen apart because it was never um, brought to absolute maturity, James challenges us that we should really grow to be mature and complete Christians, not mediocre, uh, mediocre Christians or half-cooked Christians, but mature, complete, not lacking anything, able to do the will and the good purpose of Jesus Christ in any situation. Uh, I want to point out that this word mature here uh, we're going to see it pop up in other places in, the, in James. It's not found many places in the New Testament, but uh, most of the time it's translated, uh, what word do I have here? Perfect. You know, this is the same Greek word that Jesus used when he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Same word. James is really a master builder because he believes that the kingdom of heaven and the work of, of Jesus Christ, his Lord, has the ability to do amazing work in the mind, heart, and life of a Christian. And so he aims for perfection when thinking about and when writing this letter um, when thinking about the gospel and when writing this letter to, to, the, to the, his recipients, including us. But, you know, these days, uh, uh, not many have a uh, aiming for perfection. Instead, uh, lots of times in our modern-day Christian culture, there is a kind of uh, just getting by or just, just good enough to, to sort of skate into heaven. 
But James doesn't take that attitude even remotely. In fact, he teaches against it because he mentions this word perfect not just one time in his book, but four times. Uh, it may not sound like a lot, but that's a lot. So other topics that he didn't introduce us to last week includes wisdom from God. Whoa, this is a big one. We're going to see it pop up. Um, not, not really too much in today's passage, but in uh, chapter 3, we're going to see it. He also told us about God's generosity, that all good and perfect gifts come down from our Heavenly Father above. He mentioned double-mindedness. He's going uh, to deal with this um, in chapter 4. He introduced us to this concept, a very important one that comes up today, about rich and poor, and about how the rich are fading away but the poor, those who, um, who uh, persevere through trials, they're going to receive the crown of life. So he talked about reward. He also introduced us to a, a topic that's going to come up also about self-deception. When believers think something that's actually a lie and then fool themselves. This is going to come up in many places. And so we saw that he, he basically, uh, near the end of the passage, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James has a big emphasis on doing what the word of God says. And uh, that's going to be uh, a big part of today's passage. But when I um, uh, uh, mentioned this uh, last time, do what it says. This is also the exact same teaching that Jesus echoed when he said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So James really echoes uh, the, the book of Matthew in many ways, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Did anybody have a chance to read uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 since last Sunday? Oh, darn it. Come on. Okay. Uh, please. It's worth your time. When, when you read James and then you read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you're going to be, oh my gosh, it's like James just like, kind of like took the Sermon on the Mount, reshuffled it around a little bit, and uh, added some good stuff from maybe Proverbs, and then came out with this book. You know, uh, the book of James is deeply rooted in Jesus' teaching and in the wisdom of the book of Proverbs as well. But we saw uh, this interesting thing about, um, he mentioned the perfect law that gives freedom, and he taught us that when we look in the mirror and when we look in the perfect law, we need to uh, remember and put into practice what we read. And if we don't uh, do that, we're like somebody who looks in the mirror for the, maybe for the first time in their life and then walks away and just forgets. So to do, to do is to remember. And then lastly, in summary, we, we uh, were mentioned, uh, we were given three things to do. Does anybody remember what the first one is? Yes, wow, Abraham, good job, very impressive. Yeah, bridle the tongue, that's the first thing. The second thing that, he, that James encouraged us to do, which is pleasing to God the Father, and which is a uh, religion that is uh, uh, pure in God's eyes, was also to look after who? Widows and orphans. Look after the, the distressed people, the people that don't have a protector, the people that don't have the ability to um, serve themselves, the people that are in affliction and need. And the last thing that he said that we should do, does anybody remember what the third one is? Yes. Uh, keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. You know, um, Jesus, part of the kingdom of heaven, is purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. But the world and its ideas and its teachings have a very powerful, polluting effect on purity. 
So James uh, mentions this. And this also is going to be a constant topic that he's going to bring us back to. Worldliness that has uh, got crept into the church. So now, today's passage. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Okay. My brothers and sisters, believe, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I read that a little bit wrong. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Um, James begins chapter 2 by mentioning a problem that he saw amongst believers. That is that those who believed in Jesus Christ were showing favoritism. Now he mentions here uh, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, why do you think he mentioned glorious, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? It's because the Lord Jesus is a glorious king, more glorious than any fancy pants rich person in this world. You know, uh, uh, at, you know we live uh, pretty close to Hollywood here and you know, I'm always surprised by the, um, you know, I'll be like checking out the news or something like that, and there's some uh, a, a gala event or a red carpet event, and everybody gets so dressed up, and they're really trying to like impress people with their fancy uh, clothes. But Jesus Christ puts all of them to shame because his glory is truly glorious, majestic, and beautiful. But his, this uh, issue of favoritism kind of relates to this issue about what is glory and what is truly glorious. Look at verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. Okay. James is really good at, at building scenarios that make you really have to think about um, you know, what is right and what is wrong. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there in the back or sit on the floor by my feet. I mean, that's really insulting, right? Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James here uh, points out a problem that was evident in the church of James's time. And that is, obviously, rich people were coming in. They maybe had heard about this, this Jesus guy, right? They had heard about Christianity. It was spreading like, like a powerful, um, forceful fire just spreading out and taking over the kingdom of darkness and taking new territory. And many people were being uh, saved and brought into the kingdom, the kingdom of God was advancing, and so some rich people were maybe like interested in, and thought, what is, what's going on here? And then so when uh, they came in and checked things out, wearing their fancy clothes, their gala tuxedos or whatever, and uh, really showing, showing everyone that they had uh, a lot of wealth, evidently believers were bending over backwards for them but then also when a poor person who also heard about the kingdom of heaven, who had heard about Christianity, who had heard about salvation through Jesus came in the door, they were treated not with the greatest of attention, but in actuality were treated poorly. James saw that equality was not happening in the church. There was bias and a worldly value system being applied to the people that were walking through the door. And so he says in verse 4, Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, in, uh, in American history, in, uh, in uh, the church history, uh, history of the church in America, there's a, one of my favorite uh, old-time pastors is this guy named D.L., say it with me, Moody. Yeah, D.L. Moody. If you never heard of this guy, 
by all means, uh, uh, do some research and uh, grab a book and read some of his. He has great sermons that are online. D.L. Moody was not an educated guy. Uh, he was a shoe salesman. I thought he was a shoemaker, but then I was talking to Robert, and he's like, uh, I think he's a shoe salesman. And then I, I checked it out. I'm like, yep, he's a shoe salesman. <laughs> you know, he, he, a shoe salesman is not even a shoemaker, right? So, you know, he's not even uh, handy. He was so poorly educated that uh, he really didn't have uh, much hope in this world. But that didn't matter because God, in his wisdom, did a mighty work in the heart and life of his servant, D.L. Moody. And in, in uh, D.L. Moody's uh, time, there was a, a practice occurring in the churches, widespread and common, very similar to this passage. You know, uh, in, our, in our church, we use chairs because we like to use this space for different purposes. But, you know, obviously a lot of churches, they use pews. And back in the times of D.L. Moody, P, the, uh, the, the churches would allow families to actually rent or, you know, almost like buy a pew. And you, would, uh, you were given the opportunity to have like a small placard that would uh, say the name of your family. And then that would be on the pew on the side of it. So everybody could, you know, see that this is, this is your family's pew. And where it gets really bad is that it became a status symbol. That the farther up towards the front you were, the more prominent your family was. Because those were uh, evidently more expensive to buy than the ones that were in the back. D.L. Moody, uh, he didn't just, uh, he literally took it to heart, the idea to uh, look after orphans. His first ministry was actually a ministry to orphan uh, children. And so what happened was he wanted to bring, take orphan kids to church. But when he brought them into the church, all the pews were already taken up by families and there was no affordance for, for him and for uh, the orphan kids that he was ministering to. So somehow he got together some money and he bought a pew for him, himself and, and the orphan kids he was serving. But then what happened was the church got uh, upset at him. And they didn't like him bringing in shabby, uh, uh, dirty you know, faces, uh, holes in their shoe, orphans. And so he was asked to go somewhere else and do his, his important ministry someplace that's more uh, acceptable. Right? So the, the churches of the, of the time, not all of them, but, but many of them were very class-oriented. And so D.L. Moody took his orphans uh, and his, his sheep, you know, his Bible students, and then he started a new ministry. So there's a long, uh, this is just one example of many of discrimination happening inside the churches where believers become judges with evil thoughts. Now, what exactly are, uh, how, how are they acting as judges? They're acting as judges, well, let me, let me first tell you a story, then I'll tell you how they're acting as judges. All right, I want to tell you a story about, about two kings. Uh, these two kings, uh, not only are they uh, uh, the only thing that they have in common is that they both are rulers. That's the only thing. Everything else is completely opposite. Well, there's maybe one more thing that they have in common, and that is that they have subjects. One king, uh, the, the one on the right, uh, he has a kind of style of ruling where his law is lawlessness. It's actually the absence of of law and as a result you know he he promotes uh, a kind of philosophy or a uh, a, va uh, a um, value system which uh, can be summarized in this statement 
You know, this is what all his subjects say about themselves. My kingdom, my glory, me. My kingdom, my glory, me. Right? So they all live lawlessly as their own king for their own glory for themselves. And within this kingdom, uh, status is very, very important. Because if it's my kingdom and your kingdom, I have to have some way to distinguish myself as my kingdom being better, bigger, more powerful than yours. And so uh, in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, king's uh, realm, in his domain, there's a lot of people uh, who are ru- ruling themselves for their own glory, and they're very obsessed with status. They worry and they care about what other people think of them, how they perceive them, because every single opportunity is an opportunity to edge up in status over the others around them. In this kingdom, power, can you make people do what you want them to do, is, of high, um, uh, is highly desirable. And so they claw at each other trying to get power so that they can make other kings, other kingdoms do what they want to do. Now, another thing that's very important is this kingdom and the, the people of this kingdom do not really care about purity. They don't care about anything that's going on inside their heart. What they care about is superficial beauty. And uh, the sad thing is, is that even though beauty is fleeting and, and though many people know that beauty is fleeting, they still don't care. And they just really cherish this external thing called beauty. And the last thing, of course, the mo- probably the most uh, driving force for this kingdom is money. These four things come together to make the value system of this kingdom, which once again is my kingdom, my glory, me. And as a result of all this stuff, out comes chaos, disorder, and death. Now, what a bummer, right? That's a very sad kingdom, right? But there's another kingdom that has laws decrees and commands these laws decrees and commands come straight from the king himself and these laws decrees and commands say that everybody is equal and that everybody is on the same playing field these laws decrees and commands says whether you're rich or poor young or old, male or female, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. There's no advantage in being somebody versus another person in this kingdom. So when James says, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts, he's making a point that the believers were using the first king's thinking instead of the second king. By, dis- by making a value judgment on the rich man that he was important and making a value judgment on the, po- uh, on the poor man that he was unimportant, they were acting like people from that first dark kingdom and not like people from the second kingdom where there's full equality and no advantage based on any kind of criteria. So whether you you come from a, a good name or a bad name, still the same advantage, which is no advantage. So this was a big problem because by discriminating And by showing favoritism, the believers that James is addressing were not representing Jesus' kingdom of heaven. 
And that was a very big problem because favoritism was representing the darkness and the kingdom of, of Satan rather than representing the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Jesus. And so this practice, this mentality, this value issue needed to be resolved. Let's look at verses 5 to 7 because we're going to get deeper into, into what the problem is. Verses 5 to 7. Uh, Let's read these responsibly. I'll go first. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? James makes a great point here that um, now, oops. Um, James makes a, a great point here uh, that they valued rich people highly and they devalued poor people um, by by the by their judgments. But in reality, when we look at the Word of God, historically, God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. This is an important fact because God has chosen the things that are despised by this world to put to shame the things of this world, right? So it's, it's, a, it's like God's like secret um, kind of... Uh, uh, I don't want to say joke because it's not funny, but at the same time, he really uh, flips the world and, and, uh, and turns the table on them because he takes the things that are despised by this world, by the, by the sinful world, and he uses those very things to be powerful instruments like D.L. Moody, for instance, right? He was a shoe salesman, but he became a powerful instrument of God. He was despised, and he had no money, and he, he, he served uh, orphan kids. But then he was used preciously to do the work of God, and he was rich in faith. So God loves to use the despised things. So what was the problem? Fundamentally, the problem was is that the believers did not understand the kingdom of heaven's value system. Fundamentally, that was, that was the issue because they dishonored the poor and yet it was the rich that were exploiting them. Uh, they were the ones that dragging them into court and worst of all, they were the very ones who were blaspheming the noble name of, of him to whom you belong. But let's look at verses 8 to 13. Um, he says here, uh, and this, is, this gets into the really good part. This is our key verse section, right? So um, I'll read these verses, or I'll, I'll read verse uh, 8 and 9. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Um, he begins, uh, remember how I showed at the very beginning, like the law gets brought up a lot. You know, at first, uh, James called it um, uh, the law uh, that brings freedom. But here, what does he call the law? Yeah, royal law. Wow. If you really keep the royal law found where? Found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. So let's kind of understand this royal law. Why does he call it the royal law? Well, in any legal system, uh, and by, I'm by no means no uh, lawyer, right? But um, if you're a lawyer um, and I, got, I get something wrong here, by all means, please uh, let me know. But in any legal system, uh, you have somebody that's in authority. They're the one that has some kind of dominion some kind of a kingdom where they 
are the source of ruling. And uh, as we saw in uh, the, the example of the two kingdoms, uh, a king usually creates laws and commands that represent his mind about how he wants his kingdom to be governed. He writes down laws and commands that come from his heart and from his mind because he wants those commands and those laws to be passed down to who? His subjects, his citizens. And the citizens want to read those laws and commands because there's two things about laws and commands. You may have heard this before. There's the letter of the law, and then there's the what? Spirit of the law, right? The letter of the law, if you've never heard, it, heard about this before, is like, you know, what precisely is the law telling you to do or not to do? But the spirit of the law is way more powerful because the spirit of the law tells you where, where is the, the, what is the heart of this law coming from? What is its intention? What is it, where is it coming from? And what is the spirit that I need to think about as I meditate and think about these laws and commands that are coming from the, the king, the ruler of, of the domain that I, I dwell in. So but anyways, a subject, um, you know, they may do a, a good job of, of meditating on these laws and commands and decrees, or they may just do like a, a really bad job and not do it, right? And, and are oblivious to the letter or the spirit. And then regardless, every subject has actions. Every citizen has actions. Every subject of a, of a kingdom, you naturally take action as you live out your life. Now, those actions, though, uh, in a kingdom like, like America, um, you know, unless you like, are, uh, commit a crime right in front of a police officer, not that many people are going to see what you do, right? Like you, people get away with, uh, you know, we say people get away with murder, right? Because some actually do. But in this kingdom, for example, uh, no actions go unnoticed. Everything is seen, understood, everything is known. And not just the actions, but the motives and what was the situation and circumstances. But anyways, actions are important because every citizen, every subject is making actions all the time. And then you have a, a judge, right? And then the judge's job is that he takes the laws and commands that were established by the king, and he takes the actions of the citizen, and he carefully deliberates on what was done, how it fits into the law, and then the judge comes up with a what? Verdict, yes, a verdict comes out. And then that verdict has consequences uh, in the sense of guilty or innocent. And then, of course, the subject uh, gets to uh, experience a guilty or a not guilty verdict based on the judge's ruling. Now, back to verse 8. James's view is a very positive view about the law. He sees the law as the, the way that he can understand God's heart and intentions for his kingdom. If you really keep the royal law, and what is, what is, the, what is the spirit of the law? What is the, the king's intentions in writing his commands, decrees, and laws? It's right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so James says, if you keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing what? Right. You're doing right. This is what James wants his recipients, including us, to consider carefully. The heart of our king the Lord God, our Father in heaven, 
in establishing the precious, powerful, beautiful laws found in uh, the Torah, the Old Testament. The whole purpose of that is to help a people, to help a, a citizenship to understand the way he wants his kingdom to be run and how it should look. It should be full of mutual, caring love amongst its citizens. Not a kind of uh, attitude where uh, you take care of yourself, I'll take care of myself. If I fall, I fall. If you fall, you fall. But, you know, you don't worry about me, I'm not going to worry about you. That's not what he wants. Instead, he wants a completely different type of mentality. He wants loving citizens who are careful and cautious and concerned for each other's well-being. This is what he wants. And this is what, uh, we don't use this word enough uh, these days, but this is called mercy. Lots of times people think that mercy is like, uh, you know, when you're guilty and then a judge has mercy on you and doesn't uh, give you uh, the full punishment. That's a very limited um, definition of how the Bible uses the word mercy. Mercy is not just in the context of judgment. Mercy is when somebody is in trouble, affliction, need, and somebody who has the ability to help them pauses their life, gives priority to that person in need, and helps them. The most perfect example, so beautiful, the Good Samaritan. You know, uh, one of the uh, parts about mercy is that the person that is used as the vessel of mercy oftentimes has to take a hit. You know, to show mercy to somebody who's in need, you have to deprioritize your own life and your own needs, and your own business, and your own uh, uh, concerns, and then prioritize somebody else's as above your own. But this mercy is a foundational desire of God to see in his kingdom. The mercy of God. This value system that values mercy is at the core of God's royal law found in scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But he continues, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. To summarize this, uh, the, these verses um, succinctly, there's a, there's a kind of mentality that, uh, that when, if, let's say if there's 100 laws and you keep 99 of them and you just break one law, fairly often, you might think to yourself, well, I'm just, I keep 99 of them. Like, hello, it's like way heavier than just this one law that I break. James really uh, exposes this, men this mentality as being wrong. You can't console yourself that you do a lot of good things, but then knowingly do something that's bad and then just tell yourself, well, I do most of, I do most of the good stuff. Just one bad thing is, is, uh, is, is outweighed by all the good things. So he says, um, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So, um, and his whole point is to get to this in verse 12. 
speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Notice that he says uh, two things. Speak and what? And act. He always comes back to these two things. Your tongue, your mouth, your words, and then what you do, right? Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does all this mean? Basically, and uh, I pray that we all can take James's mentality because I think that it's really uh, important. James is very conscientious about the coming judgment. He knows, and especially Jesus' teaching in Matthew is very prevalent about this, that everyone is going to have to give an accounting for their life. And James is very concerned that his listeners would not have a bad time when their life is reviewed in the context of what is uh, in the context of this royal law. Every life event, every action, every motive, every deed is going to be reviewed not by the standards of myself, not by the standards of American, general Americanism, not by the standards of this world, but everything is going to be judged by the standards of the royal law. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. He wants us to prepare for this coming judgment that is going to be uh, based on God's royal law. Now, verse 13 has, uh, is the key verse, right? Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Let's pause there. Read that really carefully with me. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. This shows us that what is the, what is the ace up your sleeve when you come into judgment? What is going to make this judgment go smooth and, and even beautifully? A life that is filled with giving mercy to others. Look at it again. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But, you know, you reverse that. If you've been merciful in this life, like the good Samaritan, you're going to experience lots and lots of what in the judgment? Mercy. And so how can somebody be victorious over God's righteous judgment based on his royal law of love? Look at the last sentence. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If we as Christians want to not be ashamed or have our lives burn up in the, in the fire of God's righteous judgment, we need to build a life full of mercy, compassion, kindness, speaking and acting in good, righteous, holy ways. Because those who have shown mercy will be um, shown mercy And mercy triumphs over judgment. So this, once again, uh, is not just James' idea. Look at uh, what our Lord Jesus said in Matthew's gospel. 
One of the Beatitudes is actually based on this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I want mercy. I'm sure everybody here wants mercy. We need to be merciful. And that doesn't just mean if somebody sins against us. Absolutely, we have to be merciful because we've been forgiven. Therefore, we have to be merciful and forgive. But mercy means to love and to uh, support the afflicted, like widows and orphans and those who are helpless and needy and can't help themselves. But then Jesus also said something very powerfully uh, in Matthew 9, uh, quoting Hosea. And talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, he said, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Even all the way back in the book of Hosea, God was communicating this point to his people that he desired them to be merciful outgoing to do good and to show love to their neighbor, to help the afflicted, to find the lost, to serve the needy. This is what God wanted his people to be doing. This was the the type of kingdom he wanted to have, was a kingdom full of citizens who were acting merciful all the time. But let's look at verses 14 to 17. Let's read uh, 14 to 17 um, responsibly. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? James now takes us into a a new territory, but it's highly related. Now remember, in the the previous sections, uh, uh, the word uh, mercy or merciful is kind of like the main uh, focus. So he he continues this, this path, but in a little bit of a different way. See... James saw the, this issue um, that the, the believers that he was dealing with, not only were they showing favoritism, which was counterproductive or, or counter what the, the kingdom of heaven was about, but then he saw that they weren't zealous to do what they knew they were supposed to do. So he, he makes a, a, an important, disti- uh, important point here. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? And he gives us another one of his examples, a really good um, example. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Evidently, in, in uh, the audience of James, the, the vital message of salvation by faith was well understood. They knew that it was not by works not by circumcision, not by being baptized, not by anything that they could do that they were saved. They were saved by what Jesus did on the cross. And so this, this important knowledge was, was well understood by his recipients. But like a lot of things, when you know the truth, Sometimes uh, deceptions can start coming in. And with the, the deception uh, that James is clearly writing against and exposing is this idea that deeds don't matter. In fact, he makes the point here that 
anyone who thinks that deeds don't matter are in severe error. Deeds do matter. But they do not matter in the sense of deeds equals justification or through my deeds I can uh, uh, present myself as being acceptable to God. Quite the contrary. James keeps deeds where they belong, which is below, but in a supporting role of faith. Faith is still James's clear uh, focus. He actually uh, talks about deeds, but really what he, he shows here is he cares about faith. And so in his talking about deeds, he actually wants faith to become living faith. So he makes an example of this scenario where somebody uh, sees a brother and sister in need, and then they say something very nice, um, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, you know, something very, very nice. But then they don't take action. And his point here is that if you say to somebody, keep, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but you don't do something about it, how can you say that your words, that you really meant your words? Because he says in verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith can come alive when people take action on their faith. Faith is oftentimes um, viewed as just simply accepting the truth. Like, I agree that the, I, I agree uh, that I should seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. I agree. Right? That's, that's, in my, that's actually a very important step. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be looked down upon. Agreeing and accepting the truth is a very important step. And uh, as verse 17 says, it's, a, it's, a, it's faith. But that faith needs to come alive. By acting on it. And that is James's point. Is how can the quality of faith go from being you know, dead, not useful, to becoming alive and actually doing something great. So he continues in verses 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. What he's saying here is that, uh, and this, this is real tricky here, I, I think I, there must have been like five years I've been, I've been praying about this verse because I didn't understand what it meant. But uh, So tell me what you think. He's trying to represent that somebody is going to want to try to separate these two things. So that, you know, Isaiah is here in the front row that, uh, Isaiah, you have faith and I have deeds. You can't separate these two things. You know, if you have a quarter uh, and, you know, you have heads and tails, right? There's two sides to this quarter. You can't really separate the heads from the tails because it's the same thing. Now, faith is, is, the, is, is the more, um, is, is the uh, uh, priority or the primary but James is making the point that you can't separate these two things. Because he goes, and says, he goes on to say, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. The point here is, good luck showing faith without having action. Because it's just going to be words. But James makes the point that, when I put into action my faith, you can see it. It's living faith. It's faith that has come out of the conceptual world and entered into the physical world to do good. 
to show love, to fulfill the royal law, to show mercy. It's not good enough to agree in, your, in our minds. Mercy is good. Saving the lost is good. Somebody should uh, do uh, the work of salvation for the glory of God and the, and the salvation of lost sinners. I agree. That's important work. Up here, it doesn't do anything to bring love, light, and mercy into the world. But the person that sees that uh, the knowledge is a great starting point, and now my job is to, by prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith in Jesus, to bring it into this world. This is faith that becomes living faith, that brings God into this lost, dark, fallen world. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. But he continues uh, against this idea of somehow conceptual agreement to the truth is, uh, is acceptable faith. This one's really interesting. He says in verse 19, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. What does he mean by this? He's saying here that... Um, you know, agreeing that, for instance, the, in the Trinity, you know, that God is one. Praise the Lord, God is one. But just agreeing or subscribing to that truth doesn't make something happen. Because even demons believe that. They agree to that too. But they don't become uh, holy and righteous because they agree that. They're still demons. They're evildoers. So his point here is that Christians should never be content that when we study the Word of God, we hear the Word of God, and man, is the Word of God sweet as honey. It's so good, and the truth is so enlightening. But accepting it in our, in our mind, accepting it in our hearts, is a really important step. But James encourages us to now take our faith and put it into action. To do what it says. And to, to make our faith a living faith that brings light and life into this dark world by showing the mercy and the love towards our neighbor. Primarily through what we say and how we act. But let's look at verses 20 to 24. We're almost finished. Uh, let's read these responsibly. You guys go first this time. Okay, go. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So um, I also want to just, uh, real quick, I want to talk about Rahab real fast. So um, I'm going to read these. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. He just simply um, here, I mean, honestly, I could talk a long time about these last two examples, but I'm going to make it uh, kind of simple because I think you get it. Um, and it's simply that, you know, in the case of Abraham, yeah, it's crazy. He mentions two things. Uh, in Genesis chapter 15, when, when Abraham first... Um, uh, uh, believe the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. And I think it's Genesis 22. There's, there's about, like, it's hard to calculate, but uh, maybe about 30 years between when his faith was um, uh, 
uh, happen in Genesis 15. And tw uh, in chapter 22, about 30 years later, when according to James, his faith was um, fulfilled uh, through his actions. It's a pretty interesting uh, example. of. But then he gives another example of Rahab, which is her faith, which was that God was going to come and judge the city of Jericho. And then her actions were very close together. Right. So like there wasn't much of a gap between her, her the time of her faith and the time of her actions. But the, the point is, is that um, in verse 26, it says, as the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without deeds is dead. So what's the takeaway? I don't think that um, James uh, means to. He's a very practical uh, person. He simply wants the listeners, the readers, the recipients of his letter to see that there is a very important job for every believer. We're going to face the final judgment uh, sometime where all of our deeds are going to be reviewed based on the royal law, the law of, of, of uh, that uh, God's law, um, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so he simply wants his recipients to do good in this life for the glory of God and so that they can really live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so that the judgment, the coming judgment, will not be a, a time of, of pain or, or discomfort or, or of loss, but a time of victory. And so simply his, uh, his teachings are to encourage putting into practice what we know and what we learn, not to be just mere uh, hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. So I want to share one more thing. You guys okay? All right. So I want to share, since, uh, since it's the new year, I want to share an important uh, new year direction for our church. I've shared this with um, a handful of people, um, overseers, um, some people in uh, group Bible studies, um, but I want to share it uh, this first Sunday. Um, our direction for the year 2022, our spiritual direction as a church is, I know your deeds. Um, it's based on um, uh, a couple things. The first thing is, it's based on Jesus' miraculous catch. You know, in John chapter 21, um, it says, So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Um, I've only caught one fish at a time. But boy, that one fish I caught, it was, it, it was a real hassle. Can you imagine 153 fish? The verse here goes out of its way to say that the net was not torn. You know, um, if the net tears, uh, the fish will get away. <laughs> so it's so important that uh, uh, those who go fishing have a strong, what? Net. you got to have a strong net. And as I was praying about our, our church direction I was so thankful for the body of Christ because like a net where each node overlaps and intersects and makes a connection with each other, these relationships, these, um, our fellowship as the body of Christ is like a spiritual net. But our spiritual net has to be as strong as and even as perfectly strong as it possibly can be in order to catch Jesus' miraculous catch. You know, if, uh, if a net is weak, it's hard for the Lord to send a miraculous catch to a church. But if the net is strong because of unity, because of dedication to do good, that net can be used by the Lord to catch his miraculous catch. 
And so let me uh, extend this. How can we keep the net from tearing? You know, if, if Jesus sent us 153 uh, Bible students today, how, how would we be, we'll be able to like take that in and catch it, make disciples? Yes, but we need to take very careful thought to a very important concept, which we see in the book of James I want to expand on. In talking to the seven churches in the book of Revelations, every single one of them, uh, with some minor uh, differences, but basically every single one of them, he starts his um, address to the seven churches with what expression? I know your deeds. For instance, in the church of Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. And then to the church of Smyrna, he says, I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. And then to Pergamum, he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. And then Thyatira, he gets back to the expression, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. And then to Sardis, uh, this is a not a good one. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And then he went, goes on to say, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. It's not a good, not a good review. Philadelphia, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And lastly, Laodicea. Uh, another bad one. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. And then he says, uh, as we, um, I think we studied, uh, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Jesus has a kingdom, his father's kingdom. But this kingdom is not just a kingdom of knowledge and ideas and thoughts. It's a kingdom that practically brings God's love and mercy into the world. And so in order to be a fruitful and blessed church that is a blessing to this, to this uh, lost and dark world, Let's pray to understand, not just conceptually, but practically, deeds. Not to uh, earn some kind of favor from God. Definitely not. But because Jesus really wants to show mercy to this world. And so I know that we know about deeds. We know that they're valuable. But my prayer, and I ask you to pray too, is that as a church body, we would know deeds a lot better than we do today so that we like, can polish up deeds. As we can understand it and see the value of it a lot more. So please pray. Uh, as we go through the book of James and, and uh, the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation, that we all would internalize this important topic and understand how Jesus sees this topic of deeds. So um, I know your deeds. So as we uh, march together towards uh, good deeds, um, as I said, please pray for these two things. Uh, James uh, chapter 1 through 5, the study, and then Revelation chapter 1 through 1 to 3. So um, in closing, let's read the key verse for today. Uh, let's see, okay. James chapter 2, verse 13. Okay, let's go. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you so much for the Lord's mercy. It just 
really overwhelms our heart when we think about how much um, you loved us, not just in, in words, but in deeds. You sent your only son, and Jesus served us so preciously, um, ministering uh, to the lost day in and day out, and then he even died on a cross for our wicked sins and uh, to take our sins away. It's such beautiful mercy. Uh, help us that we would be inspired to show this mercy to the world, that we can um, uh, understand your heart behind the royal law, to love our neighbor as ourselves uh, in, in, um, in speech and in action. Uh, help us to love one another and also, of course, to love uh, the lost sheep uh, who are wandering, harassed, and helpless. May, you, uh, may we experience the Lord's compassion uh, for lost sinners so that we would show mercy, taking time out of our own lives, putting uh, our own lives as a lower priority so that we can prioritize uh, being used by you to show mercy and to save souls. May you uh, prepare us as a, as a church body for a miraculous catch, Lord. Uh, may many uh, lost souls find comfort and encouragement. May they find the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, working through us uh, so that they can uh, grow and become your people, your citizens, and uh, fruitful and effective um, uh, uh, children of God. We thank you for this uh, humble time. We thank you for the coming uh, glory, and we just uh, give thanks to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.